Well, good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It's definitely, keep playing with this a little bit, the lefty in me wants it on my left. This is also always, always the most anxious inducing part for me is this morning announcements when I'm kind of going off script versus going off a script of a sermon. So, But I am honored to be able to be part of worship with you this morning and John and I are joyful to be leading this part with uh, Steve and Teresa joining us through Facebook Live. I know they've already uh, thanked the group from 9 o'clock, and I'm sure they're still joining us uh, online, and well as all our other friends joining us online. I hope you are also enjoying the pre-worship slides that share a little bit about the life and ministry of our church um, beyond Sunday mornings. It's a time to make announcements about important events. Thank you to those who have been part of leading different parts of our ministry. And there is something you think would be a lovely slide. Please let me or John know as we're coming towards um, picking up things more for the rest of the year. Those slides are something we love sharing with you all. And I hope build the anticipation to being able to worship together. I want to also thank this morning um, Don DeMoy and Thrive Church, who were part of feeding our soup kitchen ministry yesterday. I've heard reported that they fed 70 people and had 40 folks come back for seconds. So it's still a vital part of our ministry. And they have let us know that, surprisingly, we have run out of plastic bags. Didn't think that was possible had you asked me a few weeks ago, but we have. So if you are coming back from your grocery run and have collected all of those empty plastic bags, please drop them off at the church, and they will be put to good reuse. Um, so thank you in advance for that um, generosity and gift. Um, I think that is all my major announcements. So welcome to worship, and let us continue together. Please join me in our call to worship. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. May God's glory fill the whole earth. Together may we worship the Most High God. Let us continue to worship God by singing hymn 611, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, and those words will be up on the screens as well as in the hymnals and the pews. for the 
Please be seated. The witness of Jesus Christ calls us to love one another. And even when we fall short of that call, the riches of God's grace promise forgiveness of our sins. So now, in humility and faith, let us open our hearts to the healing of God's forgiveness. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Most merciful God, forgive us. We imagine that we can live without you when you give us our very breath. We seek to control others rather than strive to live in unity. We allow fear to overtake us even though our lives are in your hands. Draw us back into your steadfast love and shape us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. We lift these prayers in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. According to the riches of God's grace, which God has lavished upon us and sealed for us by the promised Holy Spirit, hear this good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. Consider what God has given to us in Jesus Christ. Remember that even now the Holy Spirit dwells in us and rejoice that we are a part of God's plan for all time. So whether it is in the plates here at the back of the sanctuary or online, let us now present our offerings of thanksgiving to God. your whole life long, way in the middle of the air, way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel, Ezekiel saw the wheel, up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel, saw it way in the middle of the air. And the little wheel turned by rain, and the big wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel up there, way in the middle of the air. There's a little wheel a turning in my heart. There's a little wheel a turning in my heart. In my heart, in my heart, there's a little wheel a turning in my heart. 
There's a little song a singing in my soul. There's a little song a singing in my soul. There's a little song a singing in my soul. There's a little song a singing in my soul. To sing and shout way in the middle of the air. Before six months, they're all turned out way in the middle of the air. If you want to sing that holy song way in the middle of the air, you'll have to sing your whole life long way in the middle of the air. There's a little wheel a twinning in my heart. Way up in the middle of the air. There's a little wheel a twinning in my heart. Way in the middle of the air. Little wheel run by faith. And the big wheel run by the grace of God. Wheel in a wheel, way in the middle of the air, way up there. Is it you saw the wheel, way up in the middle of the air? pray. Divine giver and Lord of all, all that we have is a gift from you, and your grace is all that we need. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may increase your blessing to others through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I would like to invite our youngest disciples to join me down front in the front pews for their time together as youngest disciples. Good morning, sir. Well, good morning. So glad you guys could join us down here. I wanted your all's help this morning to help me tell a very important story that Jesus taught his friends and those who asked him a question. You see, one day, a gentleman came up to him and was very confused, and he was just a little worried. And he asked Jesus, what can I do to be a good person? And Jesus, instead of answering that question and with some very, you know, very clear rules of what he should be doing, instead Jesus told this gentleman a story. And to help share this story, I was curious if you guys maybe wanted to help me. You want to help me tell this story? No? That's okay? I get to be all the characters at once? Maybe, maybe a few people be a couple characters? Okay, Brett, we'll have you help me out with the first part. Okay, so there is this gentleman, Brett here, was on his way to a really far away place where he had to go on a walk. So let's go, for, we're going to go for a walk. And as he was on his way to his journey, some very mean people came up and they beat him up. And he got really hurt, so fall down. Oh, no, he's really hurt. That works. He's really hurt in a lot of pain, and he just can't go any far. He's on the side of the road, very, very hurt. And as he was on the side of the road, he was hoping maybe some people, as they were walking by, would help him. And some folks did. Does anybody else want to help? Yes? Okay, come here, Austin. Okay, Austin. So Austin was this kind man on the side of the road, walking along the road, he was someone very important in a church. He maybe even could have been a music director. We're not sure. You know, he could have been someone like that. And as he was walking along the road, he heard something. He heard somebody yelling, help. help. Say it yell again. Help. Help, help. And do you know what this music director did, Austin? He 
looked at that poor man in trouble. He crossed to the side of the street. You want to cross the side of the street with me? And he walked on by. He didn't help. Good job, you can sit down. And then along the path, so the, he was still left there. And then along the path came someone really important. I don't know, maybe a minister, maybe a pastor, maybe someone like me. I don't know. He could have, that kind of person walking by. And this person started walking by too. And they heard, She heard, help, help, help. And do you know what she did? Absolutely, Zaman. Zaman may have heard this story before. That person walked on by too. Didn't help him. She was very hurried. She was in a lot of trouble. She had lots of things to do. She couldn't help. And then, this was the part of the story that really surprised those listeners then. Maybe you heard this part too. Zaman, you sure you don't want to help? No? Okay. Well, I will be the next person, too. All right. Got to change characters. I should have brought hats or something. <laughs> so then the surprising part of their story was a third person came walking down. And it wasn't what this person wore that was surprising or, you know, that what color their hair was. The fact was, at that time, there was two groups of people that really did not like each other. Didn't matter what they did, didn't matter what was going on, they did not like each other. And the person on the ground was this one group, the Jewish people, and the other person was these people they did not like. They called them Samaritans. So when Jesus mentioned that person, a Samaritan, was walking down the street, and when that person heard they stopped. They helped up that person in trouble and they carried them all the way to a safe place and made sure they were okay and helped bandage up what was wrong with them and even paid for him to spend the night someplace in a warm bed. They were amazed. So maybe that answered the question of what it meant to be a good person. Hmm. So I, maybe that story we could think about this week as we talk to God in prayer. Will you pray with me and close our time together? Thank you for your help. Let's pray. God, we thank you in the stories of Jesus that we learn what it means to be a good person and to help those we see in trouble. We hope that you remind us in the ways that we live today to be a good person and to be a helper in our lives. It is in the name and the life of Jesus that we hope to be. It, through his powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Take care. Friends, the prayers of the righteous are powerful. So let us now pray for the needs of our world and of one another. Let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, we ask that you receive our prayers of hope and healing on behalf of the church and of the world. King of kings, we pray that you will give wisdom to all leaders and people to resist the earthly powers of fear and violence that destroy our common life. Prince of peace, in the face of injustice, oppression, and brutal power, we ask that you strengthen our wavering wills to stand in the power of Christ. Creator of all, stir up in us the power to care for your creation, not as resources to be exploited, but as a precious gift to be held in trust as a revelation of your faithfulness. As the chief cornerstone, we pray that you will inspire your church to share Christ's love beyond the safety of its walls and fill us with an infectious joy for sharing your gospel as we welcome your coming reign. Merciful God, we pray that you will bring healing and wholeness to all who are troubled by broken relationships, abuse, illness, or trauma of any kind. Restore us in your peace. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of family and the opportunities to travel and see loved ones. 
We pray for all our church family that will be traveling this summer. May their time be meaningful and special. Keep them safe and grant them traveling mercies. Eternal God, in Christ you gather all things up in heaven and on earth. We pray that you enfold, enfold all those who will be born this day and all those who will die into the joy of your never-ending realm of peace. For our hope is set on Christ as we live to praise his glory. Merciful God, today we especially lift up all those involved with the building collapse in Surfside. We pray for all those who are missing and know that you are with them no matter what. We lift up those who are afraid and alone. We pray for those who await news of loved ones and are struck with grief and disbelief. We pray for all those involved in rescue and recovery operations, for all those who care for others and put the needs of others before their own. We pray for first responders, those in the military and law enforcement. We pray that you guard and guide them to walk in your path. Healer of every ill, we pray for all those who are in need, for all who are dealing with destruction from storms, for medical teams around the world, for those whose bones are weary, for those who show us the power of community to give hope to the frightened, and for all who have asked for our prayers. We continue to lift up those who struggle with COVID, and we pray for your presence, your healing, and your peace that surpasses all understanding. Trusting in your abundant mercy, O God, we commend into your care all for whom we pray in our own lives, through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Listen now to God's word to us this morning. As Paul writes, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love. Become servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. In the summer of 2003, a song seemed to be playing everywhere, whether on repeat on the radio or as you entered a store, or maybe it was played again and again at parties or gatherings. You could say it was the song of the summer. It was titled, Where is the Love? In its chorus that plays again in your head, by the Black Eyed Peas went a little bit like this. And I'm going to read that chorus to you because I am not the Black Eyed Peas. And I don't want our morning sermon to be silenced early um, through Facebook for playing an unauthorized song. So to prevent that, I'm going to read the chorus to you. And I hope maybe it might refresh hearing this maybe before. And it went like this. People killing, people dying, children hurt, and you hear them crying. Can you practice what you preach, or would you turn the other cheek? Father, 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 help us. Send some guidance from above. Because people got me questioning, where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love, the love, the love? 
It felt that summer like the terror and uncertainty of 9-11 was still so fresh. The anxieties of our nation overflowed into all aspects of our lives, and even how we entered airports changed forever. I remember exactly where I was that day, the before and the after, and how we seemed to have seismic and such large shifts of how we lived together immediately after 9-11-2001. And these tremors we're still dealing with today. That song seemed to speak of those questions I asked of myself. And sometimes only music can speak to those questions we asked of our, ourselves and one another. Sometimes a song's chorus speaks to us and stays with us. I had that chorus running in my head as I began to think about what to speak with this sermon and its impact in my life and the culture in 2003. And I was surprised to learn and refreshing what exactly that art, those artists were saying. It turned out they had recorded it again in 2020. They had added some new lyrics and questions about what was going on in our world today but yet the question was still relevant. Where is the love? Those seismic shifts and questions <clears throat> happened to us all in this past year too, no? If there is one letter, one writing of Paul that you would take the time, I ask you, whether you've committed to reading the Bible in a year or not. It's one I ask you to read and allow Paul's words to sit with you. It's Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. Galatians. It's six chapters. In my Bible, about five pages, 170 verses. And yet, in those verses, you hear Paul speak plainly and passionately, a clear identity of our Christian Christian faith. It's a letter when Paul says what he thinks and he really gets direct of what it looks like, the clarity of what it means to have faith as a Christian then and I think even today. Martin Luther, that first reformer which we Presbyterians can trace our branches of origin, called Galatians his pet epistle. Here, in Paul's words, we get the seeds of the Reformed faith, that grace is a gift. While we were invited into this family of faith, the Jewish faith through Jesus the Christ, and we can emphasize the value of Judaism to clarify how we now should live, you shall love your neighbors as yourself. Paul reminds us, no, he demands of us that faith and Jesus Christ is enough. Accepting such grace is faith. And Luther and those early reformers saw this epistle relevant to their life as a church, what could have been, what could have been, what was going wrong in the 16th century. And I think it also continues to be relevant to us today. There is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Grace is a gift. We don't deserve or earn on our own. God is gracious and forgiving through Jesus Christ, not because of anything we have done, but because that is who God is. Faith is a gracious response to such a gift. Grace is that unconditional and radical act by God that when we are confident in that grace, it is sufficient and that faithfulness should lead us through the death and life and death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. It should evoke from us one response, a life of love. Yet, 
What does that life look like? How does one know that they are practicing such love and living into that grace one has already received? For Paul, that love he's attempting to get across and that, to that church in Galatia, this agape love is more than sentimentality or warm, fuzzy feelings. Love is a sum and substance of what it means to be a Christian. It is orientation and the focus of one's life for another. And it is through loving service is the proper exercise of that freedom. Paul reminds the church and continues to ask of us, what does that look like? How could it continue to be a challenge today? And I wondered, what could it look like when... I think of what contemporary actions and worlds out there that we could look to to give examples. And I wanted to share with you um, a clip from the movie called Patch Adams when he speaks to the board of doctors in regards to his unorthodox caring practices. But it was silenced in the first movie, in the first worship service. So I will describe it to you, and I hope this clicks for you, and maybe you'd want to watch it in full yourselves to meet this gentleman, this pastor almost, this doctor. He's based on his real life as Dr. Patch Adams because he approached his being a doctor just a little differently to remind us of you saw the movie poster of his doctor's coat and he is wearing a clown nose and some big rubber shoes. The movie describes and shows us ways that he has been a little unorthodox in his caring as he cracks jokes and becomes different characters in relating to his patients. It reminds us in his ways to attempt to humanize and better interact with his patients because Dr. Patch sees his mission and the mission of, ministry, of medicine to treat the patient as well as the disease. And as that movie highlights those antics for humor and displays of his compassion for the people he cares for, tragedy strikes. And the question is raised by the school, should Patch continue to practice medicine? And he stands before that board of doctors and speaks to the challenges of modern medicine. He passionately pleads with those present, including his fellow medical students, that together he reminds us, he asks of them all, to treat more than the disease, to treat a person, because no matter what, when you treat a person, you win. And he asks of them to learn from their professors not just the way to ace a test or to get the best grades, but to share and learn from them compassion. May that be contagious in their work as doctors. Because he closes and breaking down in front of them all because how much he wanted, wants to become a doctor to care for others. And in that, he lost everything, but also gained everything. He peaks, speaks with such passion about his life work as a doctor, and in that reflection of what he says to other doctors and going into his life work, it speaks also to us in our life's work as Christians, as any good movie should do. We hope through living our faith that we can do what we've heard and committed to hearing again and again in God's words, in the living, breathing word of the scripture. Where is the love? 
Within Galatians, we read these words of Paul summarizing the work of the law and thus the work of Christ himself. We hopefully hear also echoes of what Jesus taught his disciples found within the Gospels as he teaches those who approach him to learn or maybe even to trip him up. Jesus speaks to those folks who gather with him in the Gospel of Matthew when a lawyer asks of him, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? It reads in Matthew chapter 22, 36 to 40. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Or maybe we hear it echoed in the Gospel of Mark when a scribe argues with Jesus and came to him disputing and seeing as it reads, the scribe asks of him, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and all of your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. And, of course, we know it from the opening of the parable, the story of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel of Luke, which our youngest disciples just relive for us. Yet, the beginning, that crucial question begins like this. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your strength, with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer do this, and you will live. And of course, we know the question that lawyer asked back, and who is my neighbor? Each gospel story from Jesus and Paul himself summarizing the Jewish law, the Torah, from Leviticus 19.18, that command to love one's neighbor command to us all to be a person who pays attention and does mercy. It is more than knowing the laws or as Paul argues with those followers in Galatia who wanted to be physically circumcised that would assure them that they were faithful followers. He reminds us all that faith in Jesus Christ is enough. It is that faith and call and doing. Where is the love? The love. How does one live as faithful people? people? How in the work of Jesus Christ can it be reflected on our very lives as we live into that confident gift of grace? Sometimes we need to be reminded in our lives that we are truly new creations and we need to hear again those stories of faith the challenging words of Paul to the church in Galatia but maybe also we need to hear stories of people around us today living faith in such a way that it inspires us 
And in pondering that question, I came across the story of a young man named Shane Jones. Shane, like many entrepreneurial young people, entered into a world where he thought maybe he could make some quick cash. He entered that world of auctioning to purchase repossessed storage lockers. He instantly thought, he initially thought that maybe he could buy these unwanted items for a low price and resell whatever he had found within them for a profit. And so he bid and won his first storage unit. And then he started to go through it. And inside he found not unwanted items or junk one would sell at a garage sale that maybe at first glance it was. But inside he found photos, mementos, family items one of a kind that couldn't be replaced. And instead of selling what he found, he tracked down the original owner and learned their story. His first unit belonged to a man who had been imprisoned, and inside that locker was everything he owned, all his worldly possessions. And Shane found that young man's family and returned it all. He gave it back. And in his first act of compassion, he felt he needed to do it again. That physical act of giving back the storage unit contents to their original owners, he found his second locker. And when he opened it up, he found in mementos, photos, a baby memory book that belonged to a woman who had lost her infant suddenly. And inside that locker were the only memories. And when she was down on the luck, she almost lost it all. And Shane returned it back to her. She had again those precious photos and mementos of a child she had lost. And when that paper tracked down Shane to ask him why, why did he practice this way, what inspired him, his mother is quoted as saying, he realized that kindness inspires kindness. And he hoped sharing his story would inspire others to go and do likewise. And sometimes we need those visual reminders that maybe stand silently in the distance, that literally surround us. Like in this photo I'm sharing with you this morning that paused me and gave me a sense of awe. This is from an artwork from a cathedral located on the shores of Lake Merritt in Oakland, California. Inside is a 50-foot high image from reflecting from their window when natural light passes through aluminum panels with 994,000 holes that I hope you can see what the light reflects into that space. I hope you can see the depiction of Jesus the Christ in majesty, borrowed from the sculpture of Christ in the central doorway of the west entrance of Chartres Cathedral in France. As natural light moves across this space, Jesus becomes revealed and brightens and reminds us all that I hope, like such we hoped our original founders brought us in our own Christ window, that we need that powerful presence of Christ with us, walking with us, present with us, even when we feel the aches of our world and we ask of ourselves, where is the love? I hope Paul's work and words and the work of the Holy Spirit be alive within each of you, guiding you and assuring you that in Christ Jesus you have indeed been 
freed to do this, and you will live. May you all be alert always, living in your lives and seeking ways to show compassion, kindness, and mercy, confident that you can answer the question, where is the love? We close our worship this morning with our closing sermon, excuse me, our closing song titled, Will You Let Me Be Your Servant? From the hymnal number 727. The words will be projected and you can find it in your hymnals as well. Please stand and sing with me. Together. May the words from St. Patrick's blessings go with you this day. May Christ be with you, Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ in you, Christ beneath you, Christ above you. May Christ be on your right, Christ on your left, Christ as you lie down, Christ when we arise. And may Christ be in the heart of every person who thinks of you. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of you. Christ in the eyes that sees you. Christ in every ear that hears you. As we leave this space through a mighty strength in the invocation of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the belief in this threeness and the confession of such oneness, may the creator of creation give you peace. It is in the powerful name of the Jesus the Christ I ask you to go and do likewise, showing love and com compassion to all those you encounter, never questioning who is your neighbor. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>